All righty, God is good. We're just going to go right into it, so please be seated. Thank you, guys. Thank you so very much. Be seated also. And um, so let me just say this, um, in case you all didn't notice, in the last couple of weeks, I think almost every week, we have a, a song or two in the, in the uh, worship playlist that is not particularly contemporary. And so what that means is that these guys don't particularly have like a cheat sheet that they can download online. So they literally have to really put their back into getting the music out and getting the songs out. And it's been such a blessing. And I just want you to know we recognize that. We appreciate that greatly. God bless you. Oh, yeah. And so what I mean by not contemporary is a lot of contemporary songs. You can just go and download the chords online and, you know, just look at it while you're driving to church. And then you know how to play. But these ones, I know that a lot of work's gone into that. And so praise God for the ladies also. Anita, Shayla, Diamond, you ladies have been bringing it. Praise God. God is good. Excellent. Awesome. Alrighty. So we still have, uh, uh, I think maybe on Tuesday, uh, a testimony that is um, kind of pending. You know, we had it on Resurrection Week, over the Resurrection Weekend, our sister Z shared a testimony of her healing. But then after that experience, she said, I would like to bring the paperwork. You understand what I mean? And so I want you guys to look forward to that. Uh, but we're gonna do something really, real quick. And I want to make sure that this part of it is recorded. So Joshua, please take note. See, so there's a man of God here. And as he walked in today, the Lord said to me, he needs to practice his testimony. I haven't told him, he, he still doesn't know who, I mean, no one knows but me and the Holy Spirit, who I'm about to call. But I'm going to put you on the spot just because I know the power in what we're about to do. Antoine. So, come on, come on. Praise the Lord. I want you to come up here. Can you give him a microphone, please? So, when you walked in while the worship was on, I heard it very clearly that what you have imagined to be the fulfillment of your desired miracle, the Lord wants you to share a testimony as though it has already happened. Now, let me tell you this. The Bible says that faith is calling the things that are as though they're not, so that they might be. So for them to be, you have to call it forth. You know, many times we dream of light and we wonder why we are in the dark. When God had a notion that light was needed, he said, let there be light. I keep telling people, if God has to speak for things to be, do yourself a favor, start to speak. And I'm not just talking about name it and claim it without a proper revelation. You know, because the Bible says, with a heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you don't believe right and you're just confessing because everybody's confessing, you're naming and claiming, you might end up being frustrated because you have to believe it first. You see, for the Lord to say that concerning you, I'm confident that he, God, acknowledges your confidence in him and he now wants you to say it you don't have to give all the details but just imagine that it has already happened and just speak it forth two or three words it doesn't matter share that testimony the way you want it to unfold praise the lord thank you <clears throat> heavenly father for bringing uh, to me a finished work thank you for allowing the things that we saw two and a half, three years ago to come into full circle. Thank you for bringing those investors in and thank you for having them go ahead and do what needed to be done. The Heavenly Father, I thank you for being able to push the kingdom forward. Um, I thank you so much for being able to build and I, I thank you so much for sustaining this thing through you and only you. That's the only way it could be sustained. So I thank you, the Heavenly Father, for making it happen um, and uh, increasing it. Praise the Lord. God is good. All righty. Amen. Praise God. We're just going to pray for you real quick. And um, while you were speaking, 
I saw men about to leave the room and their plan was to shut the door behind them. And instead of shutting the door behind them, they actually shut the door and they said, we're here to stay. So anyone that the Lord has assigned to you, that has brought to you to help you, that may be thinking of a way of exiting, will have a renewed commitment to stay. You see, what you do not know that the Lord's revealed to me is that they already had a deliberation amongst themselves. Received a note from one that they answered to that we just need to do this and we're going to be out. But they did not leave that room. They will stay until that which is a plan becomes reality. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. You may be seated. Alrighty. Okay, I'm excited to be here. You know, and I'm thankful to see y'all because, you know, where anyone who can come out on Saturday really loves Jesus. You know, because no matter how boring your life is, there is always something to do on Saturday. Even if it's just to sleep. You understand what I mean? But to come out, you know, I mean, to, no, no shade, but most people who go to church on Sunday, I mean, it's very convenient you know, what else is there to do? <laughs> you understand what I mean? You know, but to go the extra mile, I, I think is commendable. And, and that is the reason why I do not take it lightly at all, you know, for this gathering to happen. Praise God. And we just want to praise God for, you know, our sisters who are helping the, the Pritchard Foundation today. So we've got quite a f number of people out there with Natalie and Cole helping with their fundraiser to support those people who may be suffering or may have suffered from uh, stroke and what's the other one? Um, I think it's Parkinson's. But whatever they're doing, I know they're helping the poor and we just thank God for the efforts they're making today. So very quickly today, I want to share with us one or two things. It might be two things, but I'll start with just one of them. And just as a way of giving us a reminder of the prophetic words that have gone forth, right? What was the year 2023 declared to us. The, the year 2023 was declared to us here at Communion House as the year of going forth. Right? It is the year of going forth. And as it is our custom here, we like to begin our own prophetic year in the month of September and for all the right reasons because a lot of the promises that we claim, a lot of the examples that we see in scripture, a lot of the festivals and feasts and holidays of scripture follow the Jewish calendar. And you know, I, I'm always the first to say we do not idolize the calendar of any tradition or any people. But one thing that we do know is we honor the things that the Lord has put before us. You understand what I mean? Let me tell you what happened in the New Testament. When people started getting born again in the New Testament, the early church, and they were told authoritatively by apostles like Paul that they no longer required to be circumcised in the flesh. Right? When Paul came and told them that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, not of ourselves, he says he's only circumcised, the one who is circumcised of the heart. You know what happened to the Gentiles? They decided, they became very, what's the word? They became very cocky against the Jewish nation. They started to feel like there's nothing special about y'all anymore. We used to think you guys were all of that because you descended from Abraham and you, you guys get circumcised and all of that stuff. But now the apostles are telling us that Jesus has come and opened the gates for the Gentiles to come in. Now we are also citizens of the commonwealth of grace. You know what Paul said? After he noticed that they were becoming um, full of themselves in a way, he called them to order. He says the privilege that you enjoy is because they were rejected. He said, imagine how much more delightful it's going to be when they get accepted. 
Let me say that again slowly. You see, when Jesus came, he came to his own, the Bible says, but his own did not receive him. So they rejected him. And what did he do in return? He rejected them. Because the word of God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Jesus made it very clear unequivocally clear that he rejected them. He said, whosoever denies me before men, I will deny them before my heavenly father. So he rejected that nation so that there can be an opportunity for the Gentiles to come in. Before he rejected them, a Gentile woman came to Jesus that we popularly know or that is popularly known as the Syrophoenician woman. She came to Jesus Asking for a miracle. She said she needed healing for her child. And Jesus very politely yet somewhat aggressively said to the woman, healing is the children's meat. Essentially telling that woman to know her place. Which is okay because he already let us know that he has come first to the nation of Israel. Because of the promise that God made to Abraham. That was renewed in David. But you know what that woman said? The woman said it's okay. Because even when children are eating, dogs can begin to enjoy the crumbs. You know, typically in that tradition, you don't feed the dogs until you have fed the children. So the dogs have to wait their turn. They get the leftovers. But this woman recognized that there is an opportunity for the dog to actually catch a snippet before the leftover. And the moment she said that, Jesus said to her, that I have yet to see faith like this in all of Israel. Why? Because the woman recognized that God's order is, is, is God's order. This is the way he has chosen to do his thing. I respect the order, but I find a place for myself in the order. And she received the miracle that she wanted. All of those, I say, to let you know that God had a place for the nation of Israel. They lost out temporarily so that the Gentile nation can be grafted in. But after they got grafted in, they are not supposed to now take it to mean that the nation of Israel or, or the Jews and all of their traditions are now to be tossed and thrown away. So we follow that calendar not because we idolize it, but because we appreciate the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that has brought us salvation without necessarily removing and doing away with the old and ancient landmarks. I say that and I'm picking my words very carefully simply because one of the plagues of the modern day church is the followership or the, um, the idol worship of certain people who call themselves Jews who are not Jews. Now I'm saying this because the moment you mention anything Jewish, some people immediately put their walls up because they're like, no, for me to regard the Jewish nation, Jewish nation is to forever be a second class citizen in heaven or in the kingdom of God. Some people think like that. Some people think that if we say that we are Gentiles and they are Jews, then maybe no matter what we do, we're always going to be second class citizens. So the wall naturally goes up. I know where that sentiment is coming from. It is self-preservation in most cases. Simply because we see people who come to Bible-believing churches, who come to Jesus-professing congregations, who themselves deny the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ to raise money. I know that you've heard these things before. You probably have seen some of these things. In fact, I've actually donated money to some of those. Yeah, I know. The ones, those who've been, who have been here for a while, they know my story. But Jesus warned us. He says, they will call themselves Jews who are not Jews, but are of the synagogue of Satan. He says, with such people, have no fellowship. Now, what do, what do we mean by the synagogue of Satan? You see, anybody who does not profess the sonship of Jesus as the only begotten son, 
the Bible says is of the Antichrist, right? Because the spirit of the Antichrist has one key attribute and that is to deny the sonship of Jesus. And so, so as not to get confused, we can embrace Jewish tradition as commanded by God without necessarily being swayed by those who have yet to return to God but want to draw us after themselves. God is standing with his arms wide open for the nation of Israel to return to him, not just as creator, but to return to him as God. And the only way, as father, the only way to return to the father is by Jesus Christ. Okay, because I, I, I knew that I was shooting some sacred cows, but it's important for us to have this understanding. Because I've had people unable to receive certain things that we have proclaimed from here simply because we make mention to some Jewish calendar. If I may remind you, in the book of Revelations, I believe in chapter 11, the man of God, John, was talking about the two witnesses, right? He was talking about the two witnesses and he says, the two witnesses are the two olive trees that are in the presence of God and they are also the two lampstands. So which means they are not Enoch, Elijah, or Moses. Because most of us, when we're growing up, we thought that the two witnesses would be Moses and Elijah. Why? Because the Bible says they will be given the power to plague all of their enemies and from their mouth, fire will come forth. Elijah was able to call down fire. Moses was able to plague all his enemies. But that was not what the Bible said at all. The Bible says these two witnesses are the two lampstands, golden lampstands, in the presence of God, and they also are the two olive trees. Now, where did we hear that before John? Zechariah. The prophet Zechariah said, Behold, I see two olive trees, one on this side of the river and another on the other side. And what did the Lord do? The Lord himself broke one of the olive trees and he allowed for there to be. Wow, this is new. I like this. This is awesome. I'm feeling brand new right here. Almost feeling called out, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but this is good. Let's keep it going. He says, one of the olive trees was broken so that the wild olive can be grafted in. So which was the olive tree that was broken? The Jewish nation. The descendants of Abraham. They were broken so that the Gentiles can be brought in. So when Jesus noticed that he came to them and they didn't recognize him, he did like that because that was the plan. And when some of them almost started to recognize him, he made a proclamation that they will not recognize him. He says, seeing they will see, but they will not perceive. He says, hearing they will hear, but they will have no understanding. Because he was like, no, 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 no. You can't accept me now. Because we need to break you to graft in the Gentile olive tree. And so who are the two witnesses? The two witnesses refer to the ones who came to be partakers of the promise by blood, by the blood of animals and the ones who have come to become partakers of the promise by the blood of the Lamb of God. The children of Abraham in the flesh and the ones who will be called sons and daughters of Abraham by grace through faith. You understand what I mean? And so... We together bear witness because who is a witness? A witness is someone who has had the privilege of experiencing a thing, a situation, a notion. And so the children of Abraham, they got to experience God in the physical upon the Mount of Sinai. And Jesus was like, okay, we already know those ones to this side. And in John chapter 1 verse 12, the Bible says, For as many as have received him, even to those who believe on his name. And we are the ones who have just come to believe, not because we have seen, but because we have heard. Jesus says, blessed are those who believe without having seen. Does it make sense? Alrighty, that is just to kind of like make sure that no one is unsure and unclear as to the position that we take when it comes to the nation of Israel. So we are not cocky against the Jewish nation, but then at the same time, we're not ignorant of the imposters. Because we know who they are. They are warmongers. We know who they are. They do everything that God says not to do. You know, the true children of Abraham are not allowed to lend money to their brothers 
for interest. You understand what I mean? Some of these things are very simple. You know, when they did it once before, God raised Nehemiah to go and call them out. He says, y'all have taken your brothers and sisters, you've taken them hostage. You took them hostage by lending money to them and seizing their possessions. And on top of that, you are practicing usury because you are asking them to pay you interest. He said, but God told you not to do that. And so now you see why Jesus says they are not children of Abraham, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. Because those people, we see them today, they call themselves Jews, but their practices are practices of what? Extortion. And Jesus says, by their fruits we shall know them. I'm going somewhere. You see, the two things are very related. And I've already said it, but you may not have heard it. So now I'm going to say it plainly. Okay? God already told us it is time for us to go forth. This is 2023, the year of going forth. But can you go forth without, first of all, being free? The nation of Israel could not go forth from Egypt until Pharaoh and his horde got arrested and put in their place. Right? And so the ones that have held us and continue to hold us hostage by depriving us of the resources for progress and development by always looking for one war or the other to fight. The warmongers, they are not citizens of any nation. They have their own false nation that they have created. And so the Lord said to us in 2023, we're going forth. And for us to go forth, the palace of foreigners has to crumble. <laughs> Ah, uh, let me say this and I'm going to say this very slowly. Imagine being in Egypt at the time of the Exodus without knowing that God was the one at work. Just think about it for a second. Imagine if you were in Egypt at the time of Exodus, of the Exodus, and all you can see are the plagues. Even if you're not an Egyptian, even if you are an Israelite, you will panic so much so that you may not even live to see the deliverance. The reason being, these people are already mean to us before all of these things are happening. Now when all these things happen, they will take it out on us, which some, in some way happened the Bible says when the pressure was much on Pharaoh because Moses had come to say, let my people go. What did he do? He said, oh, these people dreaming about freedom. It's because they have too much time on their hands. Now they will continue to make break and this time around we will give them no straw. All right? They will make break without straw. Why? Because the, the elites, they lived around the Reed Sea, which due to loss of interpretation, was called the Red Sea. The reality of it is it's called the Reed Sea. They were the ones who lived around the Nile and around the Reed Sea, so they were the ones who were producing the straw. Whereas those who were in Goshen had no access to straw, they had access only to clay. So basically, in order for your clay to become brick, you need their straw. Now, let me explain that in mo modern economics. You know, Manuelita here, she bakes amazing cakes. Right? Because everything she needs for that cake comes from the ground. Clay comes from the ground. However, in order for her to be able to package it, she needs to buy this and buy that to put 
in there and someone else con controls the straw that goes into the clay. You see, many of us have never even really thought about how free God intends for us to be on earth. God said to, Abra to Adam that everything that he would need will come from the ground. When Jesus was teaching, he said the ground all by itself produces a harvest. Everything that I need comes from the ground. However, some people have figured out a way to make sure that without their blessing and contribution, you have no economy and your work on pro and products have no value. They determine whether you're selling for a profit or selling for a loss. They determine the value of the money that you have in the bank. You don't. You can be very risk taken and, and you can invest in corporations by buying stock. But you have no guarantee that by the time you wake up tomorrow, the stock will be there. And if it's there, is it going to have any value? I'm not just talking about gambling because stocks sometimes can be like gambling. Crypto can be like gambling. But going to work every day from 9 to 5 for 30 years should not be considered gambling because you are laboring and yet it is a gamble simply because you are hoping that by the time you retire, that pension that is backed by the stock market will still be there. There is no guarantee. And you did not gamble. You labored. And the word of God says for every labor there is profit. And so why is your labor now being reduced to gambling? Who took the power from you to produce and the power to get wealth? The ones who control the straw. And the Lord says they're about to be done away with. Praise the Lord. But now let's go back to the same question that I asked. If you did not know that God is the one at work, the same people that have always fed you garlic and onions, the same people who have always given you straw, they are now being afflicted. Will your heart not be afraid if you don't know that God is the one at work? There were people in Israel, who, in Goshen, who were afraid because they're like, these taskmasters were not nice when everything was nice and dandy. But now that their lives have been miserable, we will pay for it. The reason why I'm saying this, let me just tell you the reason so that you can reconnect and start following me because I may have lost one or two people. I'm saying this because the Lord has revealed to me that the heart of many shall fail them for fear because of what is about to happen to global economy. What is about to happen to some of the strongest currencies that we know? What is about to happen to some of the most established banking systems that we know? And because these are the people who have provided the straw for making brick, they are the ones who have controlled and determined the value of what you have, whether you can sell for a profit or sell for a loss. You by default is connected, you are connected to them in such a way that if you're not aware of what God is doing, you will expect the worst instead of believing and expecting God for the best. I'm going to say it one more time because we need to be delivered from that fear. You see, Anita, if you believe that, let's say, for example, I know you don't have an employer, you're a businesswoman, real estate person. But imagine, or let's even go back to five years ago when you still worked for an employer. And you have bills, and they are the ones who pay you like every two weeks. If one day you just hear that that company is about to go under, will you not be concerned? You will be because your bread is connected to them. But if somebody comes and tells you that the reason why they're going under is because God is making room for you to take that position and be in charge of your own straw and break. Now, you know there's a difference. Your, your attitude will suddenly change. 
Do you know that even though God did all of what he did for his children to bring them out of the land of captivity, to rescue them from a system that enslaved them, many of them did not make it into the promised land because they just could not divorce themselves from Egypt. You see, God will do what he says he will do. But if you're not conscious or aware of what God is doing, guess what's going to happen? You will continue to partner with the ones that God is removing. And by so doing, rather than rejoicing, you will be worrying. Everything that is happening in the world today, we're not in the dark. God's been giving us a heads up. You know the war that was avoided last year? Late Was it late last year that the Lord said to us in this place to get up and pray that there are two elderly people in politics and one of them has to be removed because if they're not removed, we will go to a war that we didn't have to go to and the Lord removed the elderly woman and the war was avoided. Do you remember that? Remember that late 2021, the Lord said to us in late 2021 that since we have seen the sign of the beast that was presented to the United Nations. Remember that image with the wings. Do you remember it had the, the, the face of a lion, the skin of a leopard, the wings of an eagle, and then it's got, the, it's got the, the, the paws of a bear, which was described in the Bible by John the Beloved, and it was also described by Prophet Daniel, right? And when we saw that, it was taken to the abominable place and people are like, man, the United Nations abominable place? Yes, because it has an abominable name. The word United Nations is UN, which in French is UN. And it was coined by the French and it means one. Anyone that is trying to be one outside of Christ is an abomination because when they tried it in Genesis 11 and they became, they were one and they built the tower, God says, no, this is not right. He says, while they are one, they, there's nothing they propose to do that they will not be able to do. But that, that, became a problem because all of what they were proposing to do was evil and it was against the will of God. And so God had to intervene. And since then, the descendants of Nimrod and his cohorts, who were the champions of the tower, have continued to attempt to reunite the world as one. Please stay with me. Because we need to get this. We need to get this that the Lord is doing. I'm going to back up one step. When Moses came to the children of Israel to announce that salvation had come, that the Lord had sent him with a word that will be, mani that will be pronounced through the mouth of Aaron with signs, with the rod of God in his hands, what was the initial reaction to the people who received him? They wanted to stone him to death. They were like, who do you think you are? They said, who, who's made you a prince over us? This was a man who brought word about deliverance and yet they wanted to kill him. What does that tell you? What it tells us is we can be in captivity for so long that when finally salvation comes, we might actually find ourselves opposing the salvation of God. He's like a man who's been in a dark dungeon for days. When you bring him to the surface, he will oppose the light. You don't bring a man from a dungeon who hasn't seen light for days. Immediately you put him out to look at the sun. What is he going to do? He will turn away from the sun. He will cover his face because that is no longer a comfortable place for him because he has found comfort in the dark. Many of us, we have become so comfortable in a system that rides us like donkeys. Now, I'm not talking about, don't be thinking about one country or the other. I'm not talking about countries. I'm talking about a system that is a universal system. What's the other word for universal? Catholic. Because some, we, we, we have become so comfortable with certain things that we don't even question it. The word universal is the word Catholic. So think about that for a minute. We have become so comfortable that now that the Lord is staring the part for your freedom 
many of us are praying against what God is doing. Many of us are praying against what God is doing. The Lord already told us that the banking system is already gone. What we're seeing right now is a shadow of itself. Now, this is not to scare you. This is not meant to make you feel like, oh my God, what are we going to do? We've always had banks, this and that. God has already spoken and it is what it is. But people are praying and say, God, uphold the banks, send new leaders, let's listen. And, and God is like, no, we have moved on from there. This is already decided upon, it's concluded on. It is for your own benefit, it is for your own sake. Get with the program or it is what it is. You understand what I'm saying? Now, there has to be a shift in our thinking. We need to take a different posture. Why is that? If we do not take a different posture, the wind that God has released to move us toward the promised land would actually drive us further into the wilderness. You see, the wind of God is blowing in the direction of promise. It is left to you to set the sail of your heart such that that wind keeps moving you forward rather than moving against you. How many people left Egypt? Estimated 3 million people. They were estimated to be about 3 million people. Let's even say that that was an exaggeration on the part of the initial Bible scholars. Let's even say there were 300,000 people who left Egypt. And we know there were not 300,000 because they were having children like that. And if you do the math, take the exponent of 70 and you multiply by the number of years, about 283 years of active slavery, while they were having the most children that they can have, you would come to a number that is even greater than 3 million. But I'm just saying, I just, I even want to be conservative in my calculations. Let's even say that there were 300,000 people at the time. That was a lot of people. How many people made it into the promised land? Only two. Okay, because you ain't scared. Let's go back to three million. Three million people left Goshen, crossed the Red Sea or the Red Sea, so you don't get too confused to the other side. And while they were crossing, they saw a manifest intervention of God. Very clear intervention of God. To the point wherein they agreed to take 12 stones, 12 boulders from underneath the sea as a memorial to say this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our sight. All three million people. They saw the pillar of cloud by day and they saw the pillar of fire by night. They saw the presence of God descend on the Mount of Sinai and they saw that the mountains started to skip like lambs. And I've explained that to you, that even though that, that Old Testament account doesn't really tell us when you read uh, Revelations, you see what it means for mountains to skip like lambs. It means the presence of God is so strong and so hot that the mountains will melt and form in another place. And the, when you see, if you can imagine a mountain being reduced to magma again, the motion of it is going to be like a lamb that is skipping simply because of density. Anyway, so we know that that's what happened when God came down. There was no, no, no mistaken um, identity about who came. They knew that I was God. And still, only two of them made it into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb. So, this is the reason why we cannot overemphasize what I am saying about the posture of our hearts. The reason why those other people did not make it was because even though they were taken out of Egypt, they did not allow God to take Egypt out of them. They were still thinking in garlic and in onions when they could be thinking in manna from above. What I'm telling you, like I told you before, I'm not a prophet of doom. Because it's only sounding, it's only going to be perceived as doom to you if you don't know that it is for your sake. Remember Jesus told his disciples, let us go to the other side. 
Now, these were men who were on a boat that had no engine. Remember that their boats at the time needed the wind for a sail. And when the wind came by God to move them faster to the other side, they were so afraid because they had never seen such a wind. They began to fret and they said, this wind is contrary. But Jesus was in the stern of the boat asleep because Jesus knew that it was his father who sent the wind to get them to where they're going. Because you need the wind. But because their hearts were not positioned right, they had doubts about the faithfulness of God. They questioned God's intervention and mistook it for a disaster. Because Jesus told us that that was what was going on. When he came and he saw that they were panicking, he just stood to greet the wind. And the wind decided to stay calm. Because what he said to the wind was, Shalom, how do you greet people? In Jesus' time, even till now, in that region of the world, world, when they see people, what do they say? They say, Shalom. Where Jesus stood, the Bible said, in, when you read the King James Bible, you don't get it. The English Bible says Jesus stood and it says, peace. And there was a calm. He only greeted the agencies of heaven that were there to make things happen. He just said to them, Shalom. Because I know that you have come not to drown us, but you have come to take us there with much ease. I was sleeping. They were supposed to be sleeping too because the wind that would take the sail was already released by heaven. But they decided to continue to champion their own destinies even though grace was at work. Let me say this, folks. If we don't know how to let go and let God, we will fight against God. Jesus set an example for his disciples. Let me tell you something. If you are in a situation like that and you're worrying and you notice that God is not, repent from worrying quickly and go and lay next to that Jesus. They were supposed to have seen Jesus asleep and them worrying. Now, who knows what he's doing? Jesus or the disciples? So if I say that Jesus is sleeping, I'm not going to question Jesus. I'm just going to go lay right next to him because this must be the right thing to do. This is the king of righteousness. Whatever he does is right. You understand what I mean? So because some of us, we go through that in our daily lives. We're asking God for a thing and God seems to be delaying. And instead of you to go on the side of God and just chill and just relax, you are not questioning if God is even aware of the time. Some of us, we want to know God's birthday so we can buy him a watch. Maybe if God knows the time and the, and the day, he would move quicker. Alan quoted the scripture while we were praying. I believe it's from 2 Peter. That God is not slack as some people count slackness. Because we think that whole God is, God is mocking about. No, he, he is doing exactly what needs to be done. Take the example of those guys. What did they say to Jesus? They said to Jesus, do you not care that we perish? You will say that and we say that every time we don't see what God sees. Every time we're not where God is. The same things that God has arrayed in our favor in this generation, if we are not taught, if we don't pay attention to learn, if we don't ask God, if we don't seek to know, we will take those things to mean that God is against us, whereas he is always for you. The children of Israel got to the Red Sea. And immediately, they thought the Red Sea was there for their destruction. They were like, oh, it's over. Moses has brought us to this place so that we can perish. Whereas, a couple of minutes later, what did they realize? They realized that the Red Sea was there by God to destroy their enemies. <laughs> Let me take you back to 2020. 2020, some people thought COVID was a disaster, but we didn't because we knew God gave us a heads up, right? He gave us a heads up. We've been counting down from 2015, 2018 to January of 2010, I mean 2020. The Lord told us that a time was coming 
wherein the work of separation will begin upon the earth, that the angels called the reapers were on assignment and they were boots on the ground to separate the wheat from the tares, to separate those who trust in the Lord from those who do not trust in the Lord. And God said to us, he said, that one was going to be a drill. Another full separation is coming. So we knew that COVID was a drill. The Lord made it very clear to us. He said to us that you may not be able to do certain things that you love to do. You may not be able to go to places that you want to go to and take that as an opportunity for you to practice closeness to one another and to the Holy Spirit. God gave us a heads up. So what did we do? We prepared. As soon as COVID hit, we increased the number of fellowships we were having from house to house. We were meeting at home, we were meeting online, and we enjoyed it. We made the most of it because to us, it was not a disaster because we knew what God was doing. We knew that God came along from 2020 to speed up time for the sake of the elect. Because God is like, I know Satan is enjoying this nonsense. He's going to want to drag it out. No, I don't want this thing dragged out. I want everything sped up. And so when they showed Satan the update of the time, he was like, oh snap, we need to move quickly. Where is all the confusion? Where is all the immorality? Have you noticed the spate of immorality since 2020? How the world's been pushing all kinds of agendas? Because they know their time is short. It's not even working for them. You want to do foolishness? Do it with a strategy. But now you can see everything is a pandemonium right now. Why is that so? For your sake and mine. The other day I was in a meeting of pastors and they were like, oh, what do we do? Ah, uh, the Supreme Court, the legal system is on the side of immorality. We need to pray. I said, I'm not joining you in that prayer. I said, because God is doing you a favor, but you don't see it as a favor. I said, do you know that many people in this nation and in other nations of the world have forgotten that the Lord is the judge? Many people have forgotten that it is the responsibility of parents to train up children in the way that they should go. Many people have forgotten that it is the responsibility of the saints to intercede for the nations. We have rested all our hope in the system. Thank God the system is failing us because if it didn't, we would not wake up to recognize that we've been trusting the wrong sources. I said, yeah, you keep saying, no, they took prayers out of school. Okay. But if you were praying at home and as, as you should, if you're praying at home as you should, and if we are raising children who know how to call upon the God of the heavens, they don't have to call a formal prayer. These children will be play, praying everywhere, even when they are playing. God is doing us a big favor by unveiling the beast. But guess what? Your heavenly father is the one behind the show. Why should you be afraid? You all remember the story of Joshua when he turned four. The same Joshua that is taller than his daddy now. When he turned four, we just moved here from the UK. And we'd, we, we, we asked around, what can we do for a child around here? And people said, oh, Chuck E. Cheese. We don't talk to those people anymore. That was a bad advice. I'm just kidding. They said, Chuck E. Cheese. And we're like, okay. We didn't know any better. So we went to Chuck E. Cheese. They said, well, you can pay for pizza. You can even pay for clowns to entertain the children. What do they call them? Entertainers. And so we paid for the food. We also paid for entertainers, mascots or whatever they call them. They put on all kinds of things. And the moment we showed up with Joshua and he saw those things, he was freaking out. He was screaming. He was crying. He was holding on to us. He was a lover of pizza at the time. He lost his appetite simply because he was terrified by those things. Those Chuck E. Cheese demons scared the living Jesus daylight out of him. Oh yeah, yeah. That was what they, they, if we knew that that was what they were going to look like, we wouldn't have paid for it. But guess what? We paid for him to have fun but because he was not aware of it, he was terrified. He had zero fun. We had to take him out the next day or so to somewhere else just to make it up. Now, the same thing is happening in the world today. Your heavenly father has paid for the reapers.
to come and separate the wheat from the tears, to unveil the beast. Now that the beast is being unveiled, you are crying and God is like, I paid for this. Smile. Smile. We used to tell Ariel that whenever we hired someone to come and take a family picture, she'll be crying and not smiling. We always told her, we paid for this lady to be here. Smile. God is the one behind the show. Do you know that when we read Revelations and we read about the beast, we read about, you know, like a third of world population dying in just, you know, a brief period. We read about nations crumbling. We read about the most powerful currency in the world. It's in the book of Revelations crumbling within an hour. We read all of those things and we're terrified. But go back to Revelation chapter 1 and then you will know what the rest of the book is saying. The Bible says a revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave through the hand of his angel to John the beloved. So everything that you're looking at is a revelation of love. God is demonstrating his love. He is bringing judgment upon your oppressors. It is no different from the Exodus and all of the plagues that fell on Egypt and the ones who had oppressed the people of God. Those plagues were not fun. They were not funny. They were not pleasant. But they had to happen so that you can be broken free. And yet there were people crying in the wilderness because of the loss of Egypt. They cried to God. And you know what? Every time they cried to God, God did them a favor. He gave them an exit. Because it's like, you've been following me for years and you don't know me. I'm doing all of these things for you. And all you do is cry. Okay, you're crying to your own detriment. And what happens is they called disaster upon themselves. And that was how they went on for 40 years instead of 11 months or so. So that they can all die out. Now, God did not give them 40 years so that they can die of old age. He gave them 40 years so that they can perhaps repent. And yet they didn't. How do I know that? The other people who believed God, they stopped aging. No, no, it's in your Bible. The other guys stopped aging. Do you know that when Joshua was fighting those wars, he was over a hundred years old? Because he was only a few years younger than Moses and Moses died at 120. And the Bible says that when Moses died, his eyes were not dim. He could still see very clearly. No contacts. No glasses. He could see and his frame was not bent. These boys at 100 or 105, 108, 120, they stood like people who went to LA Fitness for real. See, when I say, <laughs> and why did you have to do me like that? <laughs> no, they, they, they stood and they, they were fit. Because God was like, this guy gets it, this lady gets it, I'm going to stop the clock, they're not going to age, but the rest of these people, I will give them time to repent. And still they did not repent. You see, the manifold wisdom of God is such that God has already put in place strategies, right? Strategies for your deliverance. And he gave you a heads up in the form of prophecy. So that you are not afraid when God begins to move. When you see the wind that comes for your sake, you will not call it contrary. When you see the sea, you will not call it a grave. It is not your burial ground. It is only your passage to where you need to be. So I want to say this very quickly. I'm going to remind us of three things that God said will happen about this time. Some of them have begun already since 2020. Two, and I don't even know why they're still dragging out, but they are dragging out. And the thing number one is, like I was saying, after we saw the beast that was presented to the United Nations, what does the Bible say? The Bible says a gift will be presented unto the Lord and placed in the abominable place, right? And that beast was the gift. Where did it come from? It came from Mexico, right? And what did the Bible say? The Bible says that the gift will come from the land of a people tall and smooth of skin, a land divided by waters. All of South America is divided by what? Is divided by the Amazon, right? And where was he brought to? He was brought to New York. He was brought to the place where you have the United Nations, the UN, the abominable name is written there. The Bible says when they do that, they will also do one thing. 
they will say, now there is peace and safety. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3, the Bible says when they say peace and safety, then their destruction will come speedily without a remedy. So God gave us the heads up. Late 2021, we knew that 2022 was going to be hard. We got into January 2022 and then we saw the war between the kings of the earth. Right? Because God says that destruction will come and it will come speedily. And the war that broke out, broke out between Vladimir and Volodymyr. And both of those names mean rulers of the world. And so we saw, that's what I'm saying, that he's been dragging for a reason. Because there are certain people that haven't positioned themselves right. And God does not want them to miss the ark. But the clock is ticking. So that is thing number one. The war of the kings has become, has begun. Thing number two is the spirit of death is doing its last, its last rounds and is killing people without killing them. Let me tell you the way things are going on in the world today. More and more people are, begin, are beginning to trust in everything else but God. And that is death because God is life. If you don't trust in God exclusively, anything else that you take as a substitute is a poison waiting to take you out. It is not too late. Everything that I'm saying to you is not too late. When it's about to be too late, the Lord will bring me here also and I will tell you what to look out for. You know that we're in the season of the signs in the heavens the pillars of smoke and of blood. We're seeing all of those things in the heavens and the earthquakes, right? So it's not too late for you to start to tell yourself, I will not trust in mammon, but I will trust only in God. I'm going to give you some practical steps because I said that I've got a couple of minutes because people are wondering and thinking, so what do we do? What do we do if the banking system is going down. What do we do if the Lord is against them coming up with this unique coin or whatever they call it, this one currency with which they want to rule the world? If God does not want me to be a part of that, what do I do? If God is saying, I can no longer gamble with my resources, what do I do? I know the questions are coming and you want to know and I'll share with you some insights that the Lord has given to me. But let me tell you the third thing that is already happening. I told you about the war of the kings. I told you about the angel of death doing his thing. And then this other thing is God is shutting down the temple of Baal. You know what he said? He says, you are planted by me, but now you are burning incense unto Baal. So Baal means, the literal meaning of Baal means Lord. Okay. And so when you look at the world today, what do the most people, what do most people refer to as the Lord today? Money. Right? Most people bow to money. Most people give their best to money. Most people serve money. Money is pretty much the Lord of this system. So we call him Mammon. We call him Baphomet. We call him all kinds of things. But we're still talking about any Lord outside of the Lord. And so we see those three things are in operation. Now, you, okay, thank you, Jesus. The Lord would have me share with you two more things very quickly. So, come with me to Isaiah. Isaiah 47. We're going to look at one more thing real quick in Isaiah 47. And then all of these things will make sense before I start giving you or sharing with you some of what you must do. Isaiah 47 verse 12. We're going to quickly borrow an insight from there real quick. He says, stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorceries in which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. prevail. Verse 13 says, you are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosis prognosticators stand up and save you from what shall come upon you. 
the monthly forecasters, monthly prognosticators. And they're doing that by enchantment. The Lord is describing to us what we call world economy today. This world economy is manipulated using technology, is manipulated using all kinds of forecasting methods. They keep telling you, oh, this is the infl inflation, this is what the value of money is. Now, you don't know how all those things come about. It is to you, it is like sorcery because you do not know how it is coming about. What is about to happen is we're about to have the lords of the system admit to us, quote unquote, that their sorceries have failed, but that they have no ones. Let me say that again very slowly. You know, before the, uh, those two banks in California, before the collapse, about two or three weeks before they were shut down or taken over, what did the Lord say to us here? The Lord said to me, tell the people that they will be hijacked, but it is the same people. So what did they say? They said, oh, it was taken over by the feds. Before the feds took it over, whose was it? Exactly. Because they are the makers of the straw. It was the same people. But why did they tell us that? They told us that because they want us to be of a particular mindset. But we didn't fall for it because God already told us what to do. He said when they say there's a casting down, you say there's a lifting up. The power of life and death are in the tongue. This war that we're fighting is a war of conversations and confessions. Basically, everything that they would tell us, they would tell us so that we can say things that will give up our power to the enemy. So when they tell you that, oh, well, this system has failed because we can, there's no way to check the inflation. We've raised interest rates and all of that, and it's not working. So this is what we're going to do. We are going to have a summation of all things into one. And this time around, oh, everybody's going to be fine. You will own nothing and you will still be happy. When they say that, they want you to say, now listen to this carefully. They want you to say, oh, okay, we shall see. And you know what? why you shouldn't say that? Because the moment you say, okay, we shall see, you're agreeing with them and you're putting your trust in whatever they present. But this is what the Lord wants you to say. Come with me um, to the book of Jeremiah chapter 6. Now, because at the end of the day, God has made it very clear. There are certain things that we should not say. And there are certain things that we should say, but we should not keep quiet. Jeremiah chapter 6, we're going to quickly read verse 4. And we're going to read verse 11 if, if 4 is not too long. It says, prepare war, Jeremiah chapter 6. Prepare war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe to us, for the day goes away. For the shadows of the evening are lengthening. Arise, let us go by night and let us destroy her places. Now look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. I will pour it out on the children outside and on the assembly of young men together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife and the aged with him who is full of days. Let me combine those two for you very quickly. The first one is a confession of, oh my God, everything is against us. Even the night is lengthening. We're getting weary. But verse 11 says, I am now full of the fury and I am going to empty it out upon the children that are outside. We cannot stop at saying, oh my goodness, this is so confusing. What are we going to do? How are we going to make it? They're dragging this thing out too long. The night is, is lengthening. We're becoming weary. Yes, that is your flesh speaking. Your emotions are speaking, but you need to shut them down by speaking to the fury of God. It is the fury and the anger of God against the system that is making them do what they are doing. So your confession should always be that the system is confused. I can see it. Satan is running helter skelter. I know it. But I will put my trust in the Lord. 
That is what you and I need to do. We need to put our trust in the Lord. Yes, I know your emotions are getting frustrated and you're becoming weary at all of these things that are going. But let your spirit in a holy anger declare that no matter what is happening in the world, you will not be moved because you know that it is God that is at work. I'm going to give you some practical tips real quick. Tip number one is I want you to start to look at the assets you have. Start to look at the assets you have. Look at the money you have. And begin to speak the word of the Lord. And these are some of the things that I say and some of the things that I believe that we all should start to say. I've been professing this thing for like two years. And this is what I've been professing. I tell my wife all the time. I tell my brother and some other people who get to listen. That whatever is in my name remains mine. Let me say that again. Look, I didn't make it up. I didn't download it online. The Holy Spirit said it to me. I had a visitation of the angel of the Lord carrying the word of the Lord and he said to me, he showed me that when the time comes that whatever is in your name will be yours. I'm not supposed to just hear that and say, oh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for looking out for me. No, I'm supposed to agree with heaven because I can believe in my heart, but I need to confess with my mouth. You need to declare that whatever is in your name is yours. First of all, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You need to profess that your house that is in your name is yours. You see, the money that you have may not be yours, but the value that it holds in your name can be yours, regardless of the transition that happens in the world. Not everybody will come out on the other side the same. Some people will land on their butt. Some people will land on their heads. But it is the will of God for you to land on your feet and begin to run when the new dispensation comes. A new dispensation comes and you will not be at a loss. So what do you do? Begin to confess. Whatever is in my name is mine to keep. Whatever is in my name is mine to keep. It might have to be in another currency, but the value of it is mine. It might have to be in, in, in other denominations, but whatever it is that is of value is mine. Simply because the Bible says it is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and adds no sorrow. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But let me tell you something, when he gives it to you, he doesn't change his mind. The Bible says that the gifts and the calling of God, they are without repentance. If he has already given it to you, unless you don't know that he gave it to you. If you think that the wealth you have right now is because of the currency that your wealth is denominated in, that you're not thinking God, you're thinking mammon. And mammon can choose to disappear one day. It is actually a commandment of God that that which is of mammon, money, would develop wings and fly away. So if you do not want to wake up one day and not have money and not have value, then begin to confess that the value of the asset in your name is yours. How heaven will do it, you don't have to worry about it. Many of us were doing too much. That's the problem. We're moving money from here to there. Oh, maybe this is going to be safe. No, there is no safety outside of Christ Jesus in the times that we're in. You understand what I mean? There is, no, there is no safety outside of Christ Jesus. Now, I'm going to speak this word prophetically over you as well. Let me tell you this. You see, the thing is, many of us, we are spoiled because the system has always given us straw. So when the system takes away its straw, you don't know how to make brick. So what do you do? What you need to do by the grace of God? See, when the music stops, that means they're telling me it's time up. Good job. I think they've planned it. Music stops, Antoine goes out, put a little pressure on the man of God to wrap up. Oh yeah. So I may not get to the third one, but I'm going to tell you this one real quick. Right? I've already told you, declare whatever is in your name is yours. I started talking about the second thing. What did I say it is? Do you remember? Creativity. We're spoiled because we've always had the system to lean on. But God has new ways of blessing and prospering you that does not require help from mammon. Oh uh, yeah, 
So let me tell you something. Whenever there is an exodus, the only way the exodus is going to be successful is if there is divine intervention. Divine intervention always looks supernatural. These people had always gone to the farm and grown things that they would eat and the ones that they do not grow, they go to the, to the bosses to provide, right? They go to the, to the Egyptian elites to provide for them, right? So things like healthcare, for example, many of us, we don't have our own hospitals. So we always rely on some other corporation or agency to provide health insurance, even though you still pay for it. You understand what I mean? But they provide it. And so we become so accustomed to depending on them. Now the Lord did this for the children of Israel that even though they were in the wilderness and they did not have all of the support of Egypt anymore, they did not lack anything from God's perspective and from the perspective of the believers. But for the ones who still were depending on the system, they saw their position as a precarious one. They thought they were at a disadvantage. They would wake up in the morning and cry. The Bible says grown men wept because they had no meat. But manna was on the field. The Lord is saying, you need to align your heart with heaven's creativity so that you know how to make do with what God is bringing and be in abundance so that you are not at a loss. Let me say that again. If you make do with what heaven is doing, by aligning your heart with creativity, you will continue to produce. But the ones who do not tap into that creative juice within them will continue to complain simply because they refuse to grow. In the season that we are going to, God will begin to birth ideas in us. He will send us angels. He will send us manner. But your taste has to change. If you're still f expecting things to remain the same, I'm sorry things will not remain the same in the world. Remember, what is 2023? The year of going forth. The most significant changes to world economy will happen this year. And it is already happening. So, you know, I told you that little by little, I'm going to be releasing to you the things that the Lord told me about bricks. What was the first thing I told you about bricks? In case you don't know, if you have not been listening to the news or you just came out from under a rock or you were just raised from the dead, there is an alliance of nations called BRICS that stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. BRICS. And that alliance is there to create a world currency or a currency for doing business globally. Right? So they're creating a currency they want to get away from the US dollar. Right? And so that BRICS, I told you, that if they had consulted me, because God already showed me, it's not going to work. Okay, in case you're watching, you guys, your bricks is not going to work. Why? Because bricks in Genesis 11 did not work. The Bible says they used bricks instead of stone. Right? So why fabricate bricks when you can just go to stone? Stone is natural. And it is called gold but they said no yeah yeah but the bricks is kind of like backed by gold why do it that way you understand what i mean so the first thing i told you about bricks because of the fact that it is man-made and it is done by worldly kings under vladimir it is still the same thing it's not going to work i'm just saying just so that you're aware. So when you're, when you're making your plans and someone is trying to tell you to bring all your assets into an economy that is made subject to bricks, tell them, no, thank you. You understand what I mean? Because it's not going to work. So I told you that already. What's the second thing that I'm telling you now about bricks? I just told you that today. If you're going to make bricks, you need straw that you don't provide. You understand what I mean? So that's the other thing about bricks. There's a lot. There's a lot more about bricks, but... The Lord is having me release it to you little by little. And why is that so? God does not want you to put your trust in anything that anyone or any man or any system is making. Your trust should absolutely be in God. So now look at this in Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 19 verse 3. And then we're going to break bread and close. And I'm going to pray for you because um, one of the things 
that the Lord revealed to me while we were in worship is that hearts need to be delivered. We need to be washed from the inside out. You see, because we have been part of this system, many of us since we were born and, the, and our fathers before us were in this system, just like the children of Israel had been in Egypt for generations, they knew no other way of thinking. They knew no other way of operating, right? So it takes the outstretched arm of God to deliver people from a particular kind of mindset. You see, there are people here by the grace of God that I've already seen who will make it through the transition and land on their feet. They will make it through the transition and land on their feet. One day it will seem like they've lost everything, but by divine revelation, they will know that they are just about to gain everything. You see, the difference between you and others is the confidence that you will have in God. Do you know what happened to Noah? Do you know that one day it appears as though everything that they knew was about to be buried underwater? Everything was about to literally go underwater. The ones who are behind this system, some of them are vampires. They've been around for hundreds of centuries, hundreds of years. It's not conspiracy theory, it's the reality of it. They've been around. So they know these things. That's why they allow for us to use certain words while we're speaking. You know, they say things like, oh, it's going underwater. Yes, they're not just making that up. It is an ancient expression that means total loss. When the world was about to go underwater, to Noah, if he hadn't been in tune with the Holy Spirit, what does it seem? Well, what would it have looked like? It would have looked like they were about to lose everything. You know that all the righteous people died before the rain started falling, with the exception of Methuselah, because Methuselah was appointed by God to be an evangelist alongside with Noah, witnessing to the world. But the others died, and the Bible says God took them because he did not want them to experience what was to come. Right? So they had lost friends. They had lost, they had lost comrades. And they were about to lose everything that they knew. Even cities that they were part of building. That was their feeling or experience one day. But guess what happened? The next day, they gained everything. After the ark, I mean after the rain and the flood, and they subsided and they came down. There was nobody else but them. It was all theirs. This is good news, folks. Let me tell you something. God made a promise. Remember in Psalms chapter 8, verse, Psalms chapter 8, God says, all the people that have been ruling the world, they're my children. All of them, because God is the father of all spirits. The principalities and powers. He says, they're my children. He says, but they've done badly. He says, I will come and take the earth back from them. I will inherit it again. And then, who does he give it to? He gives it to us. And so, when you think about it in reality, the nature of this transition, particularly when it comes to this system of mammon, I'm warning you so that when it happens, you don't even lose sleep for half a day. What I'm saying is one day, some of us will wake up or go to sleep as though we've lost everything because of what they call re-denomination. But you will wake up the next day to realize that now you have everything. Amen. Praise God. Matthew chapter 19 verse 3. Don't worry, I encourage you. This, mess, this sermon is actually maybe 90 minutes, right? You can listen to it at least once a day for the next one week. Because when you, when you listen to it again, some of these dark sayings will begin to make sense to you. Now, 19 verse 3, what does it say? The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? For just any reason. And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? This is where it gets interesting. And he said, verse 5, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. What I want to draw out of these folks is this. We have become one with the system in the flesh. Until death do us part. <laughs> And since we have refused to die in the flesh to the system, God is doing us a favor. Amen. 
God is taking out the system. One way or the other, once there is death, you will be made separate. Only do yourselves a favor. Don't follow the system to its grave. Did you get that? God is doing us a favor. John, we have become so dependent on this system that is anti-Christ. And God is taking the system down for your sake so that you can be free. Don't follow it to its grave. It has happened before. Don't let it happen to you. I've given you the example again and again. Some of you may need to go and read the Exodus story again so that you can familiarize yourself with the various behaviors of those people that you are also capable of. Many of them got destroyed with Pharaoh simply because even though God took away Pharaoh, God killed Pharaoh so that you can be free. But you still keep dreaming about Pharaoh's table of garlic, garlic and onions. And guess what? Those people died in the wilderness. We will have a period of transition, a wilderness kind of period that may seem unpleasant and unfamiliar between the new and the old. The old is going away. The new is coming. A new government and administration of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming upon the earth. How be it for a temporary period before we go into the new heavenly Jerusalem. But I tell you one thing. Some people will lose out in that period because they will not know how to dream a new dream. They will be looking back rather than looking forward. So I say to you today, the Lord has done you a favor. The Lord is striking down the system and it will look like chaos. It will look like wars. It will look like earthquakes. It will look like all kinds of turmoil. But in all of these things, the Lord has placed a seal upon you to preserve you, your righteousness, your peace, and your joy. And whatever the Lord has already given to you, Call it your own and it will remain your own as long as you do not allow yourself to be buried with Pharaoh. Let nothing of Egypt be more precious to you than your peace that Jesus paid for. I want to say this again. There is creativity on the inside of you that is going to be worth more tomorrow than all of the jobs and contracts that you have today. Many of us are still chasing shadows in the world. And God is saying to you, what will prosper you with the world to come? I've already put it on your inside. Begin to develop yourself now. You will land on your feet. As we break bread today, I want us to make this connection in our heart to the Lord. You see, when Jesus spoke, most of his sermons were not understood. And that was why he spoke to them in parables. And even with parables, they still did not understand. So what did he do? After he spoke to the multitude, he would break it down to his disciples. Sometimes the first time they still wouldn't get it. And then he would break it down to them again. But the times that they got it, what was different? The times they got it were the times that they went to ask him. Saying, Master, all that stuff you were saying is for you. We didn't get it. Now break it down to us. Okay? There's a reason why. Because heaven's messages are typically coded. The Bible says that the things of God are foolishness to those who are outside. So what do you do? Those of you who are inside, you receive the encrypted message of prophecy and then take it to God in prayer and say, God, Thank you for your prophet that you sent. He was saying all of those things and he was even saying it in a Nigerian accent. It was going over my head. But you sent the word. Now break it down to me. What shall I do? What must I do? What is the posture of my heart? I keep hearing Genesis 13. Let's break bread with Genesis 13 verse 7. And by so doing, we will receive deliverance from every entanglement of the world. Let me tell you something. The Lord will give you the grace to identify what is of value and quickly lay hold of it before everything goes underwater. Oh, yes. Okay, so Genesis chapter 13 verse 7. Look at what it says. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. Verse 8. And Abraham said to Lord, Please let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. 
is not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. When Abraham and Lot were clashing, what was the solution? They had to go their separate ways. They need to be made separate. I was asking the Lord, I said, Lord, I thank you for this prophecy to the body. Thank you for these alerts. Thank you for these warnings. Thank you for making these things clear. I said, but I can hear somebody from the back saying, what about me right now? Lord, minister to me. I want a personal word. And this is in response to you, whoever you are. I heard that call from the audience. And the Lord is saying, this is the word for you. There are certain people that you need to separate yourself from. And you already know it because there is conflict. You, you want to stay friends. You want to stay partners. You want to stay associates. But you don't have peace. Every time you get on the phone to have a meeting with them, you don't have peace. Every time they say they're coming to visit you, you don't have peace. The fact that you are experiencing conflict is indicative of the fact that the separation is at hand. So I want to encourage you, whoever you are in this place, the Lord has heard you, the Lord has answered you, the Lord has given you exactly what you must do. And even if it's for a period of time, it is still needed. Eventually, God delivered Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. So don't be too concerned about what God is doing or how God is going to handle the other person. You'll be concerned with obeying and responding to what God is saying. Certain business partnerships have to be downplayed. You just have to say, you know what, I think for now we need to go our separate ways. Certain friendships, because every time they come, they keep putting fear into your heart. You need to tell them, you know what, for now. You don't necessarily have to go and tell them, I'm breaking up with you because you're always making me afraid. No. The Bible says wisdom is profitable to direct. Just tell them, I just need to be by myself for a while. I need some space. I say this to you because you came here today primarily to hear that God wants you to separate yourself from conversations that are not wholesome, from conversations that are too fearful, from conversations that are too tactical. Some of the people that talk to us, they talk to us from the sorcery of the world, from worldly knowledge. They know everything. They don't know how you're going to avoid this and how to avoid that. But then at the end of the day, is your salvation in the hand of the hireling or in the hand of the good shepherd? You need to learn to follow the voice of the good shepherd. It may seem to cost you something today, but it will pay you everything tomorrow. It is the hour of faith. And let me tell you something that God's been telling me all week. I haven't even told my wife this thing, but all week the Lord's been telling me we are in the season of quick decisions. The time is short. There's no dilly-dallying. You don't, we've run out of time. We, we can't afford to be over deliberate. No, God wants your discernment to be sharp and he wants your obedience to be quick. The moment God says, this is what I want you to do, I want you to do it and do it speedily. Father, I'm in the mighty name of Jesus. Okay, one more thing. One more thing and we're going to break bread for real this time. You see, the word of God is living and powerful. But that word of God is not working for everybody. Because not everybody's working it. And you've already recognized that. But the word of God is not yet open to you. You open the Bible, but the Bible is not open to you. I want to pray for you today. If you are saying, if I, let's, let's just have a moment of, of reverence. You know, with every head bowed, if possible, just to just be in that reverence in this particular moment. And you're saying, that's me. I'm, I've made a few attempts at studying the word, but it's not open to me. I want you to just raise your hand where you're at. This is not for anyone to see, but as a demonstration of your confidence in God, the one who can truly help, and say, Lord, open your word to me. Father, I'm in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you because these hands that have been raised are receiving help from the helper himself, the Holy Spirit. And the next time they open their Bibles, the next time they open scriptures to study, they will receive illumination. They will receive light. They will hear what your Holy Spirit is saying unto the churches. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So let's go ahead and be ready to break bread. I'm just going to read one scripture while we break bread. And that will be all for today by the grace of God. 
Um, and it's going to be from Psalms, I mean, not Psalms, Matthew chapter 23, verse 4. And it says, For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move with them, will not move them with one of their fingers. As we break bread today, I want you to claim this promise. That any burden that has been placed on you by man, by principalities or powers, any burden that was fabricated just for you to make your life difficult and to slow you down, you have already been set free. So you will begin to live free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You're free because of the body of Jesus that was broken and his blood that was shed. So as we eat of the Lord's body today and drink of his blood, we did nothing to qualify for this body and blood. He was why we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. So regardless of where you're at in your walk with God, in your consciousness of the things of God, please do yourself a favor. Take the bread and take the blood because this is what brings you in. And so as we break the body of Jesus, as we eat of the body of the Lord Jesus today and drink of his blood, we eat unto freedom, unto liberty. We eat unto the release of the anointing that breaks yokes and lifts burdens. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You may eat and drink. Praise the Lord. So with all the healings that we have seen of late, I don't want to deprive anybody an opportunity. I don't want you to come in here today with infirmity in your body and go home remaining the same. So just very quickly, it's already past nine, so we don't want to muck about, but let's do it very quickly. If you need healing in your body, I want you to come forth real quick. I would love to pray for you. Praise the Lord. Just very quickly, anybody? Alan, can you please get me the oil? The Bible says, if any one of you is sick, let him come, let him call the elders. Let them pray, anointing them with oil, for the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Alrighty, God is good. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I'm going to ask you, and then once you tell me, we're going to pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you because healing is a children's meat. And we are called sons once we believe. For as many as have received him, even to them that believe on his name, have we given the power to be called the children of God. And so this woman is your child and she stands in sonship, being led by your Holy Spirit. So there is no reason in heaven and on earth for her to be denied of healing. Father, it doesn't matter how long it's been, what we know that there is no infirmity that predates the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And so it doesn't matter how long you've dealt with it. What matters now is in this moment, by the prayer of faith, the Lord deals with it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the oil of the anointing, just as a symbol of the confidence that we have in the process that you have instituted, that we should pray for the sick, anointing them with oil, so that the prayer of faith can be fully activated. Lord, in Jesus' name, Father, I do not desire to hear from my sister again of being troubled by this infirmity because you have already paid the price. By your stripes on the cross, Shayla was healed. Let her come into the fullness of the work that you did so that the next we hear of her and her health, it will be a testimony of deliverance. Let the water of your word, even that pure water, go through her system and cleanse her of every infirmity. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus has given the authority to declare that your sins are forgiven. Be made whole in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother John, I will pray for you. I want you to stay aside here. First of all, Mike, let me, let me pray with you. If it's something you can tell me, please go ahead. This one. 
Father, I'm in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, you have instructions that you have given directly to the heart of your son. Things that he must do in this season. Things that you have commanded. Father, I thank you because these instructions have already been delivered to him and they will be made even clearer to him once he begins to execute and to act on them. And so, in relation to that, I ask for this healing to be a sign unto him of the urgency of your request and commands. Let this healing be a sign unto him that those instructions are from you. Let this healing of his shoulder, even in this instant, Lord, let it be an energizer of his faith in the mighty name of Jesus. Can you pour me just a little bit of the oil? Mike, if you don't mind, I'm just going to dab a little on your head. Just a little bit more. Praise the Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, this man receives his healing this moment in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for the ministry of your angels. Father, we thank you because we have seen this before here where shoulders were healed in an instant. Lord, we just ask for the same to happen again today. Be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. And if there be any thoughts in your mind causing this discomfort, let there be a renewal, a transformation, and a release that you may enjoy the full healing of your shoulder in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to exercise your faith in this very moment and just move that shoulder and just raise that hand and just do whatever you couldn't do before. It's still stiff. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, that was what you showed to me and it is by wisdom that I do these things just as my Lord Jesus did by wisdom that this will be a sign a validation of the instructions that you have put in the heart of your son. So right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I command for that infirmity to leave, for that discomfort to dissolve, and for wholeness and health to come to this arm in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive strength in your arm by reason of the anointing in the mighty name of Jesus. Release your faith and release your arm. Move that arm again. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, it's going to go. It's going to go higher in the mighty name of Jesus. It's going to go higher in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you because we are your children and these things you have already done so that we can have the more than abundant life. Even though we pray a prayer of supplication, making our pleas known unto you, we know that we are already deserving of these things by grace, not by any other qualification. And grace is a constant. And so nothing denies your son of his full healing in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to move your arm once again as you go back to your seat. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this man will be fully healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother John, God is good. Oh, yeah. Okay, praise the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, we agree with our brother John today by faith concerning his wife that her healing will be made complete and made complete quickly and thoroughly in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we call forth this testimony of deliverance, this testimony of healing in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Be made whole. And I want you to do this. Where is the oil of the anointing? I thank you, Lord, because this man Standing here in the gap for his wife today, once she get home, I want you to lay your hand upon her and just encourage her to open her heart to receive by faith the prayer of the saints. We have prayed here in agreement and we will not be denied of this healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Awesome. We'll say that one more time. We thank God for what man has found because it gives us an opportunity to engage the healing balm so that we can tell man what we have found. Woman of God, you have found help in the loving Savior. 
You have found help in your redeemer. You have found help in your healer. The one who heals you. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, this will be yet another testimony that puts to shame the reports of men. In the name of Jesus, whatever is in your body that is not of God, that is causing you discomfort, loose them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. They will be removed from you, not by men, but by the angels of the Lord. So that the next time men go under the hood, what they will find is evidence of the supernatural. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, your healing is now. Your healing is total. Your healing is to the glory of your heavenly Father. Receive your healing now in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Let your heart be open to receive the fullness of what your heavenly Father has for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Okay, God is good. Alrighty. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. The Lord would allow for you in the place of dreams to see truly what this is about. There are certain things that's been, that have been hidden from you. You will see them in the mighty name of Jesus. Your deliverance begins in the mind. There needs to be a release in your mind. And the Lord will reveal to you what it is. So that no one can boast of having succeeded over you in affliction. The Lord will reveal to you that which is of man. That which is of the opposition. So that you can bring them into subjection to that which is of the Lord. Which is your wholeness and your peace. This is your season to love like you've never loved. This is your season to love others as Christ has loved you. And it will be easy. And as the Lord reveals this thing to you, you will be empowered to say no to grudge, to say no to unforgiveness, to say no to malice. Even when people bring it, it will not resonate with you because you are beaming with the radiance of your heavenly Father's love. In the mighty name of Jesus. Once you have had that dream, come share it with me. There are things that I must tell you. God bless you. And I want to pray for you, Sam. Sam, you were one of those people that the Lord revealed to me. In fact, you in particular. That as you open the word of God, the word of God will be open to you. Your heavenly father wants to speak to you through the written word. So that you can stand and say like Jesus said, it is written. You understand what I mean? When you open the word of God, it will be open to you. And you will say like Jesus said, it is written. You see those thoughts that have lingered, they will be brought to subjection when you say that it is written. So Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. I'm just going to do something, Sam, if you don't mind. I just want to lay my hands upon your eyes. That's what the Lord is revealing to me. As a sign to you to stir up your faith that in the mighty name of Jesus, your eyes are open to see the truth of the word of God. Can you move closer to me just a little bit? Actually, do me a favor. Alan, come and hold this microphone. I want to make sure I'm doing this right. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I want you to put the oil here as well. God is good. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. Because this is only a mark. This is only a mark for a visitation. Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. As you have been anointed today, it is not the oil, but the oil is a mark for a visitation. The Lord will visit you. This is your season to hear from God. To hear boldly. There are so many that the Lord has sent to you, so many around you, who have concluded in their heart that God is only an imagination of others. But by the demonstration of the power of God through your life, as you hear God, they will come to know that God is the Almighty. The Lord is sending you out there as light to rescue others from darkness. And for you to be effective, you must be a witness. And the witness is the one who hears. You will hear your Heavenly Father and He will speak to you through His Word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's just give God praise, everybody. Let's just thank God. Praise the Lord. All righty. Um, uh, Jordan, it is your time to be known. It is time for you to be known. Uh, the Lord showed to me you were wondering when you will be known. When will they see what I'm doing? When will they know what I have? 
The Lord says it's your season to be recognized. It's your season to be known. He's been preparing you to be able to take care of them when they show up. But it is your season to be known in the mighty name of Jesus. Can we just rise up to our feet and just wave our hands and just bless God and just thank God for another time of, of visitation, another time of fellowship, another time of hearing from God. Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's be seated. God is good. We're done. Alan is just going to bless the offering, so don't be afraid. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise again for what he's done. We'll uh, take a couple of seconds just to prepare our offering. If you need an envelope, we have it there at the Made New um, Desk. And um, we want to just give in faith and honor and offering unto the Lord for what he has done. To our family online, we have several ways to give at Communion House via Cash App, via PayPal, as well as the Zelle contact number there. And to those that are here, we'll just wait a couple more seconds to prepare our hearts and minds. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for you've met with us tonight, oh God. Your mercy indeed has prevailed. Word after word, oh God, you have instructed us. Deep ministering unto deep. Father, we thank you for this time of impartation, for this time of stirring up, even as we have seen, oh God, by the laying on of hands, the ministry of your healing, oh God, of your curing, beautifying us from the inside out. Lord, let these offerings unto you be pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling. Father, we thank you that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of sound mind. Lord, we say unto you as we give that we count it privileged to be here in this last hour, in these last days, O oh God. We say that all glory and honor belong to you. And everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a night tonight. We'll be back Tuesday for Family Dinner and Teaching Tuesday. You don't want to miss that. Come fellowship with us. And don't forget this live stream will be available tomorrow evening. And even as we have been instructed, let's be able to play that thing throughout the week this week, letting it get deep down. All righty? Everyone have a blessed night.